Hello, welcome to our reading tonight. My name is Amanda Moore and I'm the events chair for the Marin Poetry Center. Um, this reading series, which is a partnership between Marin Poetry Center and Mill Valley Library happens on the third Thursday of each month on Zoom for now. Um, and our future readings feature Rick Barrett, Barbara Jane Race, Rachel Richardson, and Jasmine Bolina. These are all listed on the Marin Poetry Center and Mill Valley Library websites. Our partnership with Mill Valley Library also features a monthly book club, Building Bridges, which meets on the second Saturday of each month. We just discussed Victoria Chang's obit and are gearing up for Jericho Brown's The Tradition on Saturday, April 10th, which I hope you'll join us for. We'll also be reading Kazim Ali's The Voice of Sheila Chandra in May. Again, information on these events is available on both websites. These readings and offerings are free to the public, but I'd like to urge you to consider becoming a member of the Marin Poetry Center if you aren't already. Members support our community endeavors and they fund events such as this. Information on membership is available, you guessed it, on our website. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge recent events in our country, which highlight ongoing racism and violence toward Asian American and BIPOC communities. Our hearts go out to those affected by the events in Atlanta and across the country. Marin Poetry Center stands in solidarity with the Asian American community and continues our work to learn, grow, and evolve as an organization that promotes social justice along with poetry in both word and deed. I'd also like to acknowledge that the Marin Poetry Center operates on the territory of the Coast Miwok, who have been and are the stewards of the land we call Marin. Thanks to Zoom bringing us together from across the country, I know we're not all in Marin right now. I, for example, am in San Francisco on the traditional lands of the Ohlone and Ramayatush. I encourage you all to learn about how you can know and support the Native communities on whose lands you are living, learning, and tonight appreciating poetry. Tonight, it is absolutely my pleasure to host this reading featuring Yona Harvey and Crystal Williams, two poets, longtime friends, whose poetry draws deeply on our culture and their lived experiences, and whose extraordinary lives, built both at the seat of poetry and outside it, feed their work and stimulate community and discourse. We'll hear from Yona first, then I'll pop back to introduce Crystal who will read second. And finally, we'll have a short Q&A session. You can post your questions in the Q&A section at any point, and I'll do my best to pass them along when that time comes. All right. In introducing Yona Harvey tonight, I want to start with her own words from back in 2015 in describing her work. As a literary artist who integrates found materials such as song lyrics, visual art, snapshots, and biographical information of a whole host of characters to name just a few things into her poems, she has said that part of what this genre blending work seeks to do is reflect, quote, the diverse lives and experiences of black American women through literature, the visibility and invisibility of black women, our mental health and self-care, and the evidence of our imaginations in society as manifested in our hair, clothing, speech, parenting, decisions not to parent, and interactions with other women." End quote. Indeed, Harvey's first book, Hemming the Water, which explores the life and work of jazz composer and pianist Mary Lou Williams through a variety of perspectives and voices, begins this project and her most recent collection, the fantastic You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love, both of which I should mention are widely available online and from independent booksellers. We'll drop some links in the chat tonight so you can support her work. Works along the same lines, but on an expanded canvas, including into its inquiry poems that move across time, space, voice, and experience from traditional roots to imaginative futures in order to chart Black female identity. In addition to these indispensable poetry collections, Harvey was one of the first Black women, along with Roxane Gay, invited to write for Marvel Comics. And as part of the Black Panther spin-off series, World of Wakanda, she created an origin story for a character based on the life of Winnie Mandela, 
consistent with what I so admire in her body of work. A winner of the Kate Tufts Discovery Award and the inaugural Lucille Clifton Legacy Award in poetry from the St. Mary's College of Maryland, Yona Harvey has published widely in journals and anthologies. She is also an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh and lucky for us at work on her first memoir. Please welcome Yona Harvey. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful introduction. I do not feel deserving of that introduction. Thank you. Um, I am thrilled to be here. I've been so hyped up all day about reading with Crystal and spending time with Amanda in this space. So thank you to the Poetry Center, to the library, to all the people who made this moment possible. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna start by reading one of Crystal's poems. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, well, we can maybe loop back to it in the Q&A, but Crystal is one of the first poets whose work I followed from book one, you know? So it's, it's always really exciting to follow someone like over the course of their career. I just love and admire her work. And so this poem is connected to that love. All right, this is called Sightings and it's from her most recent book, Detroit is Barn. And there's an epigraph, the path from this village to that is untranslated and that's Robert Hass. The blonde girl sitting next to me with severe hair and too many bangs is named Jemima. Her voice is musical, light, but privileged, already growing aloof. We are in first class, her mother and brother a row behind us, leaving one state of being, entering another. They reside in London, but are schooled in Paris, move between the two each week. We are two rows of changelings, I am from Detroit, know the bodies divide. Am a dry mouth twirling its troubled, scrapping tongue. My mind's muscular hinge translating frantically between England and France, Detroit and Madrid, white, black, this village and that. Today, beyond the fact of this swivel mouth mind, we have little of consequence in common, Jemima and I, bodies casting as one through the air. We sit silent, though when I say hers is a name I know, thank you, it is popular, she pips. Yes, I yield, take care, pilot, there is blue so close below, blue, brilliance and warmth, an ocean, cosmos beside me and beneath me, a life beneath this life, a watery world of meaning not mine and never meant for me. And here is an unlikely first. I smile at Jemima. Oh, nemesis, oh, nag, oh, shark and minnow, oh, voice grown small and small. Okay, so I'm gonna read a few poems from You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love. And the first one, I think just in the spirit, I appreciate Amanda's acknowledgement before we, be before we began, so. I'm gonna start with that. Segregation continuum after Ella Baker and Glenn Ligon. Layered in black, on black, on white canvas, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Looking at the way we look, looking forward, stepping back by way of up turned neck by way of three steps back, 
looking black coded by way of black modes, by way of reconstruction, by way of insurrection, by way of colored fountains, by way of elected Democrats or elected aristocrats, it is obvious we are a presence, though we have been discomforted at school gates, at rental offices, at museum entrances. Even we cannot rest who believe in freedom. We are to some an irritant, an iresome, tiresome lot. We do not subscribe just because something comes out of a leader, out of a leader's mouth, out of the mouth of a tyrant. So we are too difficult. We are much too difficult. We are much too aware. We are much too marked. We are all that matter to us that matter. We are the most comforting presence by way of nod, by way of pound, by way of sup. We are always fashionable when we do not try. We do not try to insult except when we do, but we do not hesitate to speak of the things about which we agree or disagree. We participate at the level of our thinking, by way of our thinking, by way of our mass expression. We who believe in freedom cannot rest where once hundreds and even thousands of we ordinary people had taken a position that made us very uncomfortable when we decided, for instance, to walk rather than take the bus. And in this book, I am just kind of experimenting or taking liberties with this idea that I can just continue these conversations that I wish I had, that I want to have with other people across time and space. So a lot of them are to and after other people. So this one is, I worked hard so my, did, so my girls didn't have to serve nobody else like I did except God. And that title comes from a book that my <laughs> professor, Elizabeth Clark Lewis at Howard University many years ago wrote. She wrote a great, it's an incredible book about black women domestic workers. I worked hard so my girls didn't have to serve nobody else like I did except God. Candy colored bulbs frame a girl for a holiday. If the wicked call from the other side, she doesn't hear. Blinds shut, devices blink and twitter. Before it's too late, her mother snaps a picture, anticipates angst and oddly angled aches, strawberry letters, whatevers. The mother will mark the photo tomorrow, sign, seal, we're all well one of the last acceptable print messages. Meanwhile, soup for dinner again. What else? It's winter. Herbal constellations swivel in froth, stir. She samples with a lean near bowing. Steam on closed eyelids. Mothers ought to give thanks. Simeon, she thinks instead, and then her long gone grandmother's tattered Bible, the daughter's overdue library book concerning states' rights. Why is that? She's hardly felt hated. X's and O's glow in the daughter's palm. Look how easy, the daughter often says. She is patient with her mother. Blessed be the child at the center of snow and flu season. She flew past blessings long ago, so far from a little girl, really. And because I'm in such good company, I'm just gonna read 
weirder things. We'll just roll with it. Um, this is called the Dream District January. January, I'm lost inside your industrial gray. My rig at the ready, my truck trucking, its ginormous tires flat ironing the road. Vivica Fox's mantra on the CB radio, black mambo, black mambo. More white static and fade. No word from the ladies out there. They know and don't know. They say and don't say. Don't say January. I'm driving past your peculiar highway sign painted Pasadena. January, you know I'm nowhere near. Pennsylvania's no California and getting lost exhausts me. January, I pull the air horn on your fog, pull over at a coffee house that looks like a house I know, but where are the woods, the village, and the goddamn snow? All my guilt and shame on the mount of books and poems I ought to know. Now, honey, read this. The Tina Turner lookalike owner says, hands me her copy of an anti-fracking manifesto derived from ancient tea brewing rituals. And by the way, that's all we serve. No coffee at this coffee house. Our specialty is green, Tina says, grown local by the community. All those T's and E's should put me at ease, but my bearings are lost. Where am I? Pasadena, Pennsylvania? Well, make it black and steep it long, I say. The day is wearing down on me. Um, I'm going to read this poem, Sonnet for a Tall Flower Blooming at Dinner Time. Um, and the thing about sonnets, I can never behave, I can never totally follow the rules of poems of life. So if it doesn't, totally sound like a sonnet. That's, yeah, that's just me. Okay, um, sonnet for a tall flower blooming at dinner time. Southern flower, I want to quote the bard to serenade you, to raise a glass to you. Long and tall, you are always parched and hungry. You wobble in strong winds, you puff your bright hair when it rains, you toss off the lint of dandelions, you lean into the evening haunts with your indifferent afro. You were born in the old world city, the invisible dark girl city, the city that couldn't hold a candle, a straight pin, a slave owner's sins to you. You are the most beautiful dark that hosts the most private sorrows and feeds the hungriest ghosts. And um, this is the Sonnet District and it's just pushing, I don't know, pushing the boundaries a little bit more. And if you hear me, stumble on some words. I played around like a word generator. So it's 14 couplets. And then there's also words embedded in the poem that have 14 letters. So I just use that as a pattern to kind of work my way through. I needed to make characters out of people <laughs> so they didn't get murdered in real life. <laughs> Oh boy, okay, right. <laughs> the Sonnet District. Stay woke, my ex whispered, easing into boxer shorts and skittering from bed sheets to back door, steeplechasing the furniture in less than 60 seconds. 
Turns out he'd been working for the Federal Bureau of Invisible Women and his real name wasn't Tyrone, which I should have known because when was the last time I'd met a Tyrone in the black hole atmosphere of post and ish? Turns out I'd been sonambulating most of my adult life with nary a hint of productive suspiciousness. Turns out I'd been wooed by the red wine rhythms of inebriated verse scrawled on napkins and slipped across the close quartered dinner tables of out of the way restaurants. This I'd confessed to a rapt audience of new polygamists and wayward nuns at the Center for Alternative Shakespeareans and on again, off again, schizophrenics. How could I explain? I was filled with super celestial longing and addiction to touch. Just the brush of my ex's arm against mine reduced me to speechlessness to say nothing of his dark ties and fine tailored suits falling to the floor of my bedroom. Things got out of hand when I couldn't leave him without saying goodbye 14 times. The stereo specific sparkle of my manicure holding his chin steady beneath his closed eyes. How could I have known the FBIW had amended its founding policies and taken to hiring men. How could I have known the slippery slope of sentimentality would land me in a leather straight jacket and kitten heels smashing discarded cigarettes into interrogation room tile? That stream of strangulations in the chauvinist district, my audience leaned in closer then. I can't call it but you best believe there's a spiritualizing pattern coming into alignment. The dazzling intuition of my female species systematically undermined for the sake of a male leader. Of course, I stole my files to burn later. The guards were distracted by the swing of their own voices, all mistresses' eyes and sun. You best believe I peeped the conveniently placed escape hatch in the shape of a narrow couplet from where I sat. It didn't take a telescope to find that. And I am going to end with the first poem of this collection. It's called That. And, um, I guess that's all you need to know. That. I grew up with pickles. I slept in the attic. Cigarettes, sheets laced with smoke. The heat of my father's brother's old room. Larry Blackman painted for effect and Shaka Khan's lips more like a kiss, if a kiss could walk when it came to life. If a kiss could have hips and legs and ass, well, I wanted that. And if the colors could sweat and strip me down to my slip, well, I wanted that too. Nobody knew what I was thinking up there, though maybe they wanted that, that. Thank you. Yona, thank you so much. I am grateful that this is being recorded. I can't wait to revisit that amazing reading. I hope you're noticing too in the chat, um, check in with all of your friends down there. All right, on to Crystal Williams. This is a hard one for me. Crystal Williams' work 
and her friendship loom so large in my life. I hardly know how to begin to introduce her and not spend an hour telling tales. Perhaps at the beginning, I came up behind her in our MFA program where I spent so much of my time in awe of her unstoppable drive and talent, which I learned from a great deal. But the most important lessons I took from her then were about generosity of spirit and a deep curiosity about the world, its systems, and how to make them work for more people. Crystal is first and foremost a poet. This is how she approaches the world and language, and it's what makes her so special. She is also vice president and associate provost for community and inclusion at Boston University, where she is also a professor of English. She is also a godmother and an auntie, also an advisor to many young poets and thinkers, also a friend, also a confidant, also a mentor, also a colleague. She occupies so many worlds, literal and figurative, and in each of these spheres, she offers her whole self. Of course, we're here to appreciate and listen to her as a poet, but I just have to say, if you aren't receiving her Substack newsletter called Ideas in Progress, you are missing out on reading a deeply inquiring mind as it contemplates the issues that divide us, really wrestles with how we might begin to build bridges. But to her poetry, her poetry collections in order are Kin, Lunatic, the award-winning Troubled Tongues, and most recently, Detroit as Barn. I wanna remind you, you can buy these online. Her website actually is a great clearinghouse for the, the various places to pick that up. These four books chart an evolution of identity and language drawing their wisdom from deeply human experiences, from icons and legends, from art, and from a profound longing for connection. I have learned more about poetic structure and figurative language from reading Crystal Williams' work over the years than I have from many craft books, though I can emulate none of it. Her voice is distinct. Published widely in some of the most important journals and anthologies of our time, Crystal's recent work has also been commissioned by MoMA, including Double Helix, which was included in Best American Poetry. As with Yona, I could fangirl on and on about this work, but instead I'm just gonna turn it over to Crystal. Thanks for being here. Oh, I love you so much. <laughs> I love both of these women. I feel um, so honored to be here. I see you, Jennifer Groats signing up for Substack. So <laughs> Jennifer Groats is doing, she's, she's doing two things at once. I also, um, so Amanda, thank you. I'm putting Amanda Moore's um, uh, website on this thing because Amanda is a fine, fine, fine poet. Her first book of poems called Requeening was selected for National Poetry Series by Ocean Vong. It's coming out on HarperCollins Echo. And so um, she, so you see what she's doing right now. She's doing her Midwestern, no, 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 but yes, yes, yes. So I want you all just to keep an eye out for that. Um, and of course, Yona's, I feel incredible, um, incredibly lucky to have both of these women in my life. And I think Yona's just one of the most interesting brilliant thinkers I have ever met. I'm never quite sure what the hell she's talking about. Uh, because she, <laughs> her brain is so big and amazing. So um, I feel very honored to be here um, reading among such fine poets. I'm going to read four, four of my own poems and one of Yona's poem, um, poems tonight. And I'm going to start with um, Yona's poem. I think before that, I want to say two more things. One, thank you to Julianne Randolph for her technical support and to the Marin, Marin poetry folks for um, hosting this series. And I, also, I, I guess I want to thank those of you who have shown up on a Thursday night to be here with us. I've been looking at like who's here and there's so many fine poets in this um, group and Lisa's here and Tommy and Jen and just like, you know, just it's an amazing, um, Marcy is here. Just thank you very much for being here. Kevin, Kathy, I mean, you know, Joshua, who's not a poet, but is bald and cute therefore. So whatever. I'm going to read poems now. So this is Yona's, um, a recent poem called Hickory Street, New Orleans. And I, I'm reading this poem because the music of it um, just, 
I, I was enthralled. And also, um, this reminds me of many, many things. Hickory Street, New Orleans. Like, the last time I said to you, uh, the last thing I said to you was, let's buy a duplex. Like, you live on your side and I'll live on my side and you'll rise when you rise and I'll rise on my side and I'll rise when I rise. And I said something like, let's divide these hurts and regrets and you get a stack and I get a stack and you walk a block and I walk a block and you get a poodle and I get a pug and you stub a toe and I twist an ankle and you get a wheelbarrow and I get chickens glazed with rain and you interrupt and I intercept and you call the congressman and I call the mayor and you blow a trumpet and I smash a tuba or maybe seal off all sound, sheltering the shuddering of the heart compressed, the high-pitched operas of trolley wheels breaking at the edge of midnight where magnolias shelter the stoplights and left foot lovers drunk on beignets and champagne kisses and maybe struck by the distant drift of a giant sea turtle floating toward a green wave in a tacky overpriced painting. And somehow they're safe. The couple is safe and there's no parade stilts that will break, no stars that will bend. There's just an orchid tucked behind an ear and hours blurred together. And I said something like, and you said something and I said, remember? So, of course, I jacked up that poem. <laughs> All that. <laughs> Sorry, yo, yo. <laughs> um, so the, I'm going to read four, I think, four poems. I've gotten into writing these very long um, poems. Um, the first of the poems that I'm going to read is called Elegy for Us, and uh, it was commissioned by MoMA. There, if you go to MoMA these days, there's a poetry um, tour that you can take, about six, I don't know, eight of us or so wrote poems in response to pieces that are in the permanent collection. And so this image that you're going to see is Faith Ringgold's um, image called American People Die, number 20. Um, and when I originally saw this years ago, uh, I was just, every now and again, you see an image and it just stops you. And this literally stopped me. I, I came around the corner and it was there and it's huge. Um, and I didn't know what to do with myself other than just be in it. Uh, and so when I was asked to write a poem uh, in response to something in the permanent collection, this was really the only piece that I could think about writing. Um, so I think I think that's, I need to go back to the poem. I can't see the poem now. So can you stop sharing the image? Thank you. Um, there's an epigraph for this poem uh, from Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. You wanna fly, you gotta give up the shit that weighs you down. It's a poem in multiple parts. So I'll just with silence indicate those. The orca carried her dead calf on her back for 17 days, the weight of the body slowing her as all dying weight slows us. The dead calf threatening her life as might a dying dream, as might an unforgiven betrayal. She was a constellation of grief to Lakwa, the orca mother, hauling and prodding and willing the holy baby body onward. Scientists dismissed her actions as meaningless, anomalous for orcas, anomalous for apes, anomalous for sloths, sparrows, for snow hare and bear, which is to say they reasoned and huffed. What do animals know of amplitude and love, of reliance and dependence? What can an orca know of grief? It's said that the largest living organism on earth is a grove of male trees in the Americas, an ancient among us, a being more than 80,000 years old, which means it harbors infinite hearts if we harbor what we have held and what we have known. Trillions of dreams, souls and withered ash, these quaking aspens standing as they do, tall, thin, bright, and burgeoning like lean gods at attention, each trunk an undistinguished tuber drawing sustenance from a communal core. Our failure is to believe them individual trees, 
to believe them individuals. Scientists fear, although cannot reason why, that this long life is coming to a slow, soundless end and which animals will mourn it. Which is to say, we are not omnipotent. We are not supreme. We are no more than different from the other beings, though our violences are more profound. Our intelligences are not better than an ant's, not even more powerful if by power we mean enduring. Augmented by thumbs and metal and differently comprised, our connections constrained by, confined to, defined by our huddled fearful bodies, these strange hard languages bound up between us. Drawing sustenance from a communal core, a once shared desire to understand, we are tangled, gnarled, and perishing, which is to say, if sadism is our primary distinguishing feature, we have cause only to be humbled and heed. A friend once told me that leaves do not fall from trees. Rather, trees wisely eject leaves when they are done with that particular iteration of that particular life, which is to say, regardless of whether it is true or not, all beings do have agency. <laughs> which is to say, decide. More than anything, I'm afraid of, I am ashamed of this numbness. I mourn. I did not do enough to right our injustices. I did not treat the next body as my own, believe the next body my own, which is to say, I did not love enough. More than anything, I hope my ancestors with their heavy worn backs forgive me when I stand before them naked. <laughs> I'm not even a reasonable approximation of my mother and father's goodnesses and lessons and hope when I again see them, they do not avert their eyes in shame, which is to say, if we are each just tubers, I am an unforgiven betrayal. And if we are the sum of our actions, I'm a crystalline dream, dying. Among the many amazements of trees is that no matter where they are on the planet, no matter what language they speak, they again and again and again propose birth, bud, leaf, light. And so then to you, standing before me, as if in a mirror, like a lean god, like all of the gods from all of the lands and all of the hearts, bright and burgeoning as we can be. To you, I start with this apology. Um, the next poem is uh, another ekphrastic poem. Uh, another MoMA commission, um, this time for uh, uh, the Jacob Lawrence, the Migration Series um, exhibit. Uh, anyway, this is in, also in response to uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Suns. There's a, also an epigraph here um, from Stanley Kunitz from The Layers, which is a poem I love. And uh, it is, I have walked through many lives, some of them my own. And I think the only thing you should know about this is about oh, a little over a decade ago, I got um, really interested in a poetic form called the contrapuntal, right? And that's a musical term, but essentially it's, you know, a poem, a poem, and then across poems. And you can do that three or four or five times, however many. Uh, and then I started, messing around uh, with the contrapuntal, which is a little silly to do because it's already a, a difficult form. Um, so this is a, a sort of amended contrapuntal. It's in two parts and it's another long poem, double helix. And I, I guess the only thing that you should know is I, I like the contrapuntal. I've been, I was trying to exactly replicate in form um, the content of the poem meaning. So I was trying to marry both in a way that I had not done previously. And so this is the result of that. And you'll hear lots of repetition. One, double helix. At night, my father played piano and sang, his voice our raft on a quiet lake, an island of gentleness. And because gentleness is a choice, I know something. I've told you something essential about my father 
in the history of Black people in America. And because he looked at my mother and me as if we were divine, brilliant, bright children of God, and because if gesture and spirit have weight, my father's equaled 2,000 blooming peonies, I have told you something about faith and the history of Black people in America. Scientists are full of news these days. We are rotting fruit lane to ground. In each breath, we inhale thousands of humans collected on the tongues of leaves and the pink eyes of peonies on the powdery backs of pollen. Exhaled, we each draw a millennia of history enters us and we cannot control, can only harness whom or what we host. Our traumas, the bright blue mysticisms and burnt orange murmurs, our joys and muddled currencies are archived in genetic code. I am not of my father's blood, but am of my father, which is also the history of Black people in America. At my sixth birthday party, the parents drank martinis and sangria and white linen and silk as we played on the slip and slide while the desolate beast next door snarled and snapped through the fence our jubilation magnifying his rage. He leapt and whipped into an ever reddening frenzy and because pain will out and because hatred will out and because my father sensed a shift in the air because he deeply believed my mother and me divine and the faithful have second sight. And because some Alabama born malice had taught him a lesson to do with mercilessness, the way danger wets the wind, my father tore into the house emerging with a finger on the gun's trigger. He stood sentinel the rest of the day, gun slack on his thigh, squinting at the feverishness at that fence as we leapt and shrieked and ate cake. This is what I was trying to explain to Avi when I sent him that book about the Black migration from the American South. I was trying to say, we have cause to care for and track our wounds. To be anything other than enraged or dead is to be a success if Black in America. To become a refuge, a safe harbor, is to be a miracle if Black in America. His ailing father listened quietly as Avi read aloud passages about the vicious hand of the South and burnings and bodies and swinging cold chicken and packed trains, escapees casting towards a northern brink they could not fully understand away from an ending they did. And because hatred will out, and because we cannot control whom or what we host, and because his father is a Holocaust survivor, in a moment of lucidity, he asked sadly, son, why do you insist on reading me my story? So we, the Jewish son and African daughter, mouths bursting and soured with flowers and fauna, rotting leaves and peonies and men banging at the midnight door, stood as an ecosystem of gas and fire, double helixes and light, the story of, the choices of, our fathers nodded between us. And because I wanted to touch his face as my own, and because I felt his skin shudder as my own, understood his father's stubble as my own, and because what are we if not our brothers? And because there's always been binding and burning and escaping and enduring, and because I know no better way to understand the history of humans than to tell tell you the story of my father's choice to be a raft on a lake, which no matter what more you might be told, is the true story of Black thought, Black life, Black people in America. Two, at night, my father sang and because in each breath we inhale thousands of humans on the powdery backs of pollen, I've told you something essential. And because he looked at my mother and me as if we were divine and because we were really only rotting fruit laying to ground. And because if gesture and spirit have weight, my father's equal 2000 blooming peonies. And at my sixth birthday party, the beast next door snarled and snapped through the fence. And because our mysticisms and currencies are archived genetic code and because hatred outs and because some malice had taught him mercilessness, my father emerged from the house a gun's trigger. And for the rest of the day stood as a safe harbor glaring feverishness down as we leapt and shrieked. And then Avi read passages from the book and because we 
cannot control whom or what we host. And because Avi's father is a Holocaust survivor, he asked, son, why? We stood as an ecosystem of double helixes, Alabama and Holocaust knotted between us. And because I wanted to touch his face as my own, as if we were divine, and because I felt his skin shudder as my own, as if we were brilliant, bright gods, understood his father's stubble as my own. And because what are we? And because there has always been binding and escaping and enduring. And because I am not of my father's blood, but am of Avi's father, I know no better way to explain the history of humans than to tell you. At night, my father played piano and sang, his voice our wrapped on a quiet lake, an island of gentleness. And gentleness is a choice, is a miracle in America. Uh, I'm I'm sensitive to time. I'm probably I'm gonna I'm not gonna read at the water. Um, it's a poem I like, but I think I won't. I'm gonna end with this poem. Um, so uh, the poem's title is "Year After Year." Uh, we visited Alabama, and it um, while um, the poem I just read was about the entire series, this poem is specifically about this uh, image. Okay. Year after year, we visited Alabama. After Jacob Lawrence's, there were lynchings. The past has long legs and is heavy, which was a kind of warning. Stay clear of the enormous twisted tree on Tidwell Hill. To we cousins, the tree seemed fabulous, a grand old heron, wings stroking eternity, the southern vista beneath it so soft and innocent, so dramatically green. We were dazzled. From there, our lives unfurled hypnotically before us. We could be doctors and principals, actresses and mayors. We wanted to escape their watchfulness and murmurings, their relentless apprehensions that seemed to want to rein everything about us in. Our unruly hair, our clothes and brash voices and sauce, even our childlike curiosities. So we'd climb up lay on Daisy's ancient quilt, play word games, dream up novellas about mutant bowl weevils named Bowl Winkle, lament missing summer in Detroit with our friends. Truthfully, we thought they were too Southern, too old school, overly full of moon gloss and doom. In our imagination, the past had no place among us, certainly didn't have heavy legs, wasn't resting on our shoulders and wasn't hanging from a twisted tree. We also mistook their burgeoning pity for disapproval, the weight, the growing tightness in our shoulders as ephemeral and of only that place. Thank you so much for um, you know, having us here and for being with us tonight. Thank you, Amanda, for dreaming this up. Thank you. I'm grateful for Zoom, which sort of makes this possible. I never thought I could get both of you in the same room at the same time to read, which is such a delight. Um, so I wanna thank you for, for being here and we are gonna do a little q and I already have a few questions in there um, and go ahead if you have one, type that in and we'll, we'll get started. Are you ready? This is as good as going out for coffee or dinner after, it's as good as it's gonna get. So um, more people can be at the table. So this is for both of you. Uh, Yona in the Dream District or in Origin, slash Origins, that's the title of a poem, and Crystal in Monologues from Detroit effectively weave together multiple voices, Q and A, call and response. Can we hear from Yona and Crystal about their choice of form in their poetry, maybe touching on these two incredible poems? Wait, who wrote that? Was that Lisa Stadman? It a, was not. It's Dave Cedar, who actually, he's our fantastic social media manager at the Marin Poetry Center. But he did his homework, didn't he? He read those books and read those poems. That's an informed he question. He did not come to play. I think it's ready. I'll hand it off to Yona. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's so much by 
design. I think it's always sonic for me first. So with the Dream District, the January poem, it was a little bit weird, you know, and you're already testing people's patience anyway when you introduce <laughs> dreams into poems. And so I think later after it came out of the notebook and it gets typed up, that's when I think a little bit more about like the structure of it and then how it fits in a set. So there's other little dreams happening in the book. So the, the form for me for that particular poem and a lot of the poems comes later. It comes after, you know, the sound is typically first. That's so interesting. Is that different for you? So wait, do, does the sound, does the, does the poem, does the sound come before the poem? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. So you're essentially making music and then you affix a poem to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I used to do that years and years and years. When I first started writing, I would hear a poem like music. I would actually just hear music. Mm -hmm. I probably should have been a songwriter. <laughs> Are you from Detroit? <laughs> oh, yeah. And my father was a jazz pianist, right? So I would literally hear like, I'd hear music and then I'd have to spend a lot of time figuring out, okay, what does that music mean? Yes. And then what is the language that goes with that line that would make sense to other people, which made, it made editing very difficult at okay. first, right? Because what you're doing is, you, did, you know, people think you're just editing a word or in some ways they'll think you're editing some of the music on a line, but when it's, when the line is really purely music and the language is incidental, what you're, when you're editing, that means you're editing the music. That's I had a hard time. So what changed, you know, was it that difficulty then was a part of your change in terms of your approach or your strategy or? I, I, no, I, I don't know. What changed for you? I don't know. I think, um, I think I, I think poems stopped. I think music stopped coming to me mm -hmm. in that same way. I think language started coming instead of just music. Okay. And that made it much easier to edit. Okay. And that's like in grad school, everybody would say, blah, 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 blah. And I'd be like, I can't, I can't talk to you right now. I have no interest in what you're saying because you don't actually understand the music. Amanda, do you remember? The only person I would yeah. listen to was Ken McLean because Ken would say, Crystal, listen to this music. You need to change this music. And then I'd say, ah, oh, thank you. It was the only way I could figure out. That was it. Okay. I didn't answer the question, but maybe there's another question. Well, that was good. <laughs> I think you answered it. And I kind of want to piggyback a little, because both of you, you know, Crystal with your ekphrastic poems, and then Yona, in your book, every other poem has an epigraph referring to an artist or a thinker or a writer. So where do those voices come in for you? And, and how are you responding to other artists or your work? What does that mean? Well, I feel like, like Crystal, I love mm -hmm. visual art, you know, so to be, and sometimes you get invited to respond to pieces. So some of it is like that, like that segregation continuum mm -hmm. piece, the Studio Museum in Harlem mm -hmm. and the Carnegie Museum of Art had a collaboration. And so they invited some of us to respond. So it came partially out of that. And you know, when Glenn Ligon paints, he has those canvases and there's so many words in them. So I love that, you know, there's this visual artist who's interested in AFAM lit and putting that visually on the canvas. So I just, you know, it's like, well, I may not ever meet that brother, but <laughs> I'm getting ready to talk to him. Exactly. Oh, um, so it's like, that's like one of the, great things about poetry. It's like, okay, well, I can't wait for us to meet. I'm just gonna start this conversation. And then Ella Baker gets mixed in there too. Cause I was like listening to her archive for the audio history, audio recording. So partially it comes out of stuff like that. What about you, Crystal? I guess I think, 
I think the act of being an artist is the act of being in communication with others and therefore is the act of, um, of, of, of um, inviting mm. people to be in communication with you, right? Um, so when I walk around the corner and I see Faith's American people die, she's actually asking something of me. And so I think, um, you know, for me, ecrastic poetry and, and, and you know, uh, uh, Ken is full of music, right? It's full of, like, I remember having to pay the copyright fee <laughs> for, for, for all of those damn lyrics in that book, right? So I just, um, I think of these moments as being in conversation of sort of torch passing and continuing a conversation with other people who are talking at and with me and with us. Um, it's, you know, I, it's the only way I know how to think about it, but it's, it's probably also why I'm not all that interested in ecrastic poetry that is completely reflective of just the, like just descriptive. Like that's not interesting to me at all. I'm not interested in describing, you know, something. I'm interested yeah. in the idea that the thing makes me think of, which is, I think, what the artist, I think good art, to, you know, aspires to try to make us think about something more than just, I don't know. <laughs> well, good poems, too. I mean, and that's, that's part of why we're all here tonight. I think looking through the chat, I see all of us have felt that with your work tonight, too, which has been so important. Well, we are out of questions and I think that's probably a perfect place to, oh wait, there's one that slid in. Um, maybe we'll do this last one and then I wanna be mindful of the hour. Um, so this is, um, has any other artist continued the conversation in response to your responses to art? It's a great question. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if other po like poems that say, this is, to, you know, Crystal Williams is blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that's happened. Um, I can say that some of my earlier work, in particular one poem that was really a spoken word poem, um, has this whole other little life of its own and children, you know, perform it. And <laughs> They, they do group poems and they do, you know, so that I know, but I don't know if visual, actually, that's not true. I just got a thing from a woman who got hold of some poem of mine and then was painting on it and she, in response to something I wrote, you know, and using. So I think here and there, but I'm not, I don't, I don't know. What, Yona? Not that I know of. Uh, but I think that's cool. I would love to hear back from anybody who knows something about that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Crystal, is it the Jemima poem that has its own life? Yeah. 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 Who knows what that I mean, like whatever. <laughs> it's a it's a math problem too. How many days have you been on this earth? I can see as a teacher, I know, I know where they're taking it. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much. This night has meant more to me than I can say. Thank you for being here. Thank you to all of the participants and your loyal fan club in the chat. I hope that you're feeling that love. Thank you all for being here. Um, please come back for Rick Barrett and Barbara Jane Reyes. Come back um, for our book clubs. Just come back. Thank you for spending tonight with us. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>